Hello and welcome. My name is Juraj and with Mario uh, we will show you how to design and develop autonomous race car from scratch to real autonomous vehicle. Um, we are uh, students here at Faculty of Informatics in Brno. We are studying a master's degree and as uh, motorsports fans and uh, I'm sorry, uh, as motorsports fans, we joined uh, the Oberno Racing uh, Formula student team, where we worked there for three years. We started with uh, embedded development, and then we moved uh, uh, basically to founding driverless section in the Formula student team. What's the f what's for is Formula student about? Uh, your goal is to develop a race car each year, new one. And uh, throughout school year, you are developing and creating a new car. And at the end, uh, on the summer break, uh, you are competing against the best universities in the world, uh, especially in Europe. Uh, you are competing on the tracks bordered by cones. This is very important. And uh, basically, you are trying to get, uh, have a best, best time as possible. There are multiple disciplines. You are driving with a driver but a uh, vehicle must be capable of driving without driver autonomously. So the same car needs to drive with driver and without as well. Driverless track. So you don't, uh, you have no knowledge of the track in advance. Vehicle has to be capable of driving on any track bordered by the cones. As you can see on the picture, uh, one side is uh, blue cones and another one is uh, yellow cones, which is very helpful when deciding the direction of the track. There are more disciplines. Uh, one of the easiest is acceleration, when you just need to uh, accelera accelerate on the straight uh, line and stop at the end. But there are much more difficult ones like track drive, which is basically a normal, uh, normal track. In general, uh, when you are driving with a driver, uh, you need to have some inputs that human has as well. For example, vision, we use uh, stereo cameras and uh, we use a, a LiDAR as well. I will talk about it later. Um, when you d just have a vision, cameras or LiDAR, you can detect objects uh, in front of you. But that, that's not everything. You need to map those objects, so you need to remember what objects you already seen, and you need to plan route or uh, yeah plan route uh, across these uh, these tracks and not not, uh, not to hit objects uh, of course. Uh, so for this, for this we are uh, planning our route, but you need to control the car as well. So when when you have when you already pl planned your route, you need to know what are the uh, vehicle capa capabilities and what is the, for example, turning angle of your car. So let's go to the concept and development. In our concept phase, we uh, have set up uh, some kind of pipeline model for uh, many important parts of, the, of this driverless uh, pipeline. So as you can see, first one is perception, where we are using combination of the cam uh, stereo cameras and LiDAR. Uh, then uh, there is a mapping, which maps all the inputs and creates a global and local map, which is very helpful uh, for the path planning. When you have your map, you can uh, plan your route. And of course, uh, path planning needs to be as optimal as possible, so you have the best times on the track. So let's start with the perception. Uh, stereo cameras are quite self-explanatory. But uh, LiDAR, for those who doesn't know, is basically the same thing as radar, but it doesn't uh, use uh, sound waves, and it, do it uses uh, laser scans. So basically, you are scanning area in front of you horizontally, and you are all the time you are sampling uh, the reflection time of travel for the object in front of you. Basically, this is very precise. You have uh, millimeter precision. Compared to stereo cameras, it uh, heavily depends on how far are the both cameras uh, apart from each other. And uh, the precision drops heavily with, uh, with the obje objects getting further away. 
one advantage of the stereo cameras is uh, you can tweak performance. Basically, we are using neural networks for detecting objects in front of you. And you can easily scale uh, this neural, neural network uh, as your needs uh, suit. Uh, compared to LiDAR, we have a slower refresh rate because it scans mechanically uh, objects in front of you. Uh, but you have better precision and you don't have the color. There, there are, of course, there are expensive lighters who can sample the colors of the objects, but uh, the ones we use doesn't uh, have color, and we sample color from, from cameras. So let's talk about uh, pipeline for lighter. Uh, basically, here you can see uh, input from the lighter. Uh, he uh, yields us uh, point clouds. Uh, so here you can see point cloud with uh, its distances, and First of all, we need to remove ground points because most of the points end up on the ground. Uh, th that's our first step. We are use Ransack uh, algorithm. If anyone is interested, we can talk about it later, but now I will just uh, go quickly through it. So we remove all the ground points. Then we do a point clustering, which means all the, uh, all the potential con cones get clustered by using a DB scan algorithm, which is spatial clustering, a uh, classic one. And then we need to detect if uh, the clusters are cones or it's some other object, for example, fire extinguisher or something. Um, there we use a combination of two, al uh, two algorithms. I will talk about them right now. Cone detection. Uh, first of all, we use a uh, circle fit function, which basically will uh, fit the circle on the points we see in front, uh, in front of us. As we know, cones are conical shaped. And uh, when we are uh, scanning horizontally from LiDAR, uh, we get uh, like parts of the circles as data. Uh, so we fit a circle. And with combination of linear regression, uh, this approach is based on uh, angular, uh, angular, I'm sorry, angular, um, What's the resolution? Resolution of LiDAR. Uh, so basically, LiDAR scans all the points from, uh, from one place, and we know how many points will get to the cone, cone at some given distance. So when cone is at very far distance, uh, there, uh, there are not so many points uh, sampled from that cone. And we basically made a linear regression model for that. So we know at given distance of the cluster uh, what should be uh, the number count on, on that cluster. And by regressing this, we can uh, find out uh, if the cluster is a cone or not. By combining, by combining these approaches, we can get quite, uh, quite good uh, understanding of uh, the cones or cone detection, and with hopefully as least as possible uh, uh, false positives. For camera vision, uh, we are using uh, uh, convolutional neural net networks for detecting objects. Basically, for us, we need to detect only the cones on the left and right side, so it's uh, quite easy to train. Uh, with the help of uh, of the camera of stereo camera we are using, we have a we have a depth map of all the pixels we are seeing, and basically we uh, detect object. We have bounding boxes of the objects on the left and right side of, of the cones, of course. And then we sample from the dev map what is the distance from the camera of these cones. After that, after distance from the camera, we can calculate, uh, calculate what is the position of the cones around us. For uh, cone detection, we are using uh, YOLO uh, convolutional neural network older one though, but uh, it suits our needs. And uh, one of the best things uh, of using this such a neural network is that we can easily scale uh, this uh, neural network if we don't need such a good uh, precision, but we want better performance. Of course, when you are moving quickly throughout the track, for example, 100 kilometers per, per hour, you can move in one frame uh, like 10 meters. So it's really uh, important to have uh, all the algorithms as quick as possible. and uh, that's what we uh, can tweak. For the data set, we used uh, our own. We labeled manually, but of course, it's, uh, lo it takes a long time. Uh, then we found collaborative data set, which is throughout all the Formula student uh, teams. 
and we basically trained uh, our neural, neural network on this. Next part in our uh, driverless pipeline is mapping. Uh, for this, uh, this part is really important for the path planning. Uh, every frame you can detect cones for percep from perception, so you know uh, well where are the cones at every frame. But you need to merge this data throughout the frames in between each other. Uh, this is task of mapping. Um, basically, mapping will remember all the uh, all the cone positions from camera and lidar at a given time, and it will try to merge this data uh, between frames. Uh, the mapping basically knows what is the car speed and uh, angular velocities, and by using this, we can calculate what should be the cone's next position in the next frame. And by merging this data together, we can associate these cones into the map. So basically, we know at this position, the cone is already placed there. This is important for the next steps. Mario will explain for the path planning. For mapping, we are using a SLAM algorithm. Uh, basically, this algorithm uh, associates all the different uh, positions uh, together between the frames, as I explained. Uh, first of all, inputs for that are a car, a car post from EMU, for, from uh, inertial unit, which will give you car acceleration and GPS position. And then, of course, cones seen by camera and LiDAR. Uh, very uh, important output is the global map of the cones, but one of the advantages of using a SLAM is that we've got optimized car pose. Because EMU doesn't give you uh, the best precision, we can, uh, by using all the composition, estimate uh, what is the car pose. Uh, and by pose, I mean uh, vehicle uh, speed and its uh, velocities. OK, I will give it, give it to Maria. Okay, so I will continue from here. Thank you, Uri. So the next step is path planning. Uh, the main task of path planning is to calculate the path which the vehicle should take around the track, as you can see on this animation. The main inputs are pos global map, so it is a position of all cones uh, that were detected, detected, and car position on the map. And output is most optimal uh, path around the track. There are two main ways how you can approach path planning. The first is probabilistic approach. Uh, basically, you will calculate probabilities of different paths, and you will select the path with the best probability. And the second one is cone tracking algorithms. They use some kind of tracking. For example, we first tested uh, you will select the first cone and then use a detection zone. And if the cone is in the detection zone, you will associate it with the left or right side of the track. These algorithms look ve work very good on simulations. But as we learn the hard way on real world data, it doesn't work as well. So then we have to start, had to start from scratch on the probabilistic approach. What we do, the first step is to discretize the map into triangles, as you can see here. Why we do it? It gives us ability to easily traverse the map, because all the time you know when you are inside one triangle, what is the neighboring triangle, and you can easily go through the whole map. After that, let's say we have some car position at the green dot. We will test all the possible paths to some distance limit, and we will calculate some parameters of those paths. We, cal we calculate the angle change, so for example, if there are any sharp turns, we know that it's probably not the right track. Then we look at the track width deviation, if the, the track should be uh, consistent around the, it around the whole lap, and also, other data, as you can see here, uh, we tested on the data which has a lot of false positives because from this image, it's not 
it's not very easy to know which is the real track and which are the false positive cones which we want to avoid. So here we can see it in uh, real time. As new cones in the blue are detected, we create new triangles and this is the path which is calculated from from those triangles and the car is following that path. It is important to do it quite fast because from from vision you don't see very far so if the car needs to do some kind of fast right or fast left turn you, you need to calculate the next path very early. After that when we have calculated the path around the track we want to optimize it because we want to uh, drive as fast as possible so the first step is to find the find the track limits as you can see here in the bike after that we will create uh, traverse lines uh, around the whole track and we can change with one parameter the position of the of the path at that point so with that we can then play with the path and test um, variations and with some cost function we can optimize the path to be the fastest. You can select multiple parameters, for example length of the track, safety, of course the more close you get to the edge of the track the, there is the possibility that the car will deviate from the path and hit the cones which we don't want because it's pen penalized. And the last steps last step of path planning is to calculate the theoretical speed that the car tries to tries to achieve at that point on the track so we use some kind of simplistic model which uh, gives us theoretical maximal speed and then the car will try to achieve that speed on that part of the track uh, as you can see here on the graph after some number of laps the the lap time goes from around 58 seconds down to 53, 52 seconds. That's thanks to that that the algorithm looks at the car state at each point and looks at the acceleration, the steering input, and it will determine if the car can go faster at that point or slower at that point. And the next lap, the car will go faster, in theory. Sometimes it's, <laughs> it's more difficult than that. So the next thing is car control. Main input is the the path that we calculated and the output of car controller is steering command and throttle command. So the car controller drives the car to the desired path that we want. There are two main approaches. First are PID controllers, which are simple, as you can see on this image it's basically telling the car to go more left more right and it steers the car to the desired path yeah it's a simple solution but it's hard to tune, tune properly because you have three parameters that all that you have to tune and it's not the best but yeah the de development time is a lot shorter on the other hand there are model predictive controllers which use complex models so it you have to uh, mathematically uh, express how the car turns and how the car accelerates but it has a lot better car control in different scenarios and it is potentially faster but it depends heavily on the complex models so we choose the easier route, the PID control because we wanted it to work <laughs> So, as you can see here, we use one PID controller for the steering. Basically, we will calculate the steering error, which is distance from the determined path. So, if the car is deviating from that, the steering controller will want to steer more to go back to the path. And the difference in the angle of the car and the angle of the track where the track is going. So, as you can see on this graph, here is uh, the steering error during uh, one one turn so ideally you want to steering error to be nearly zero but it's not always possible there will be always some oscillations and it depends how you tune the parameters to get the best result for 
The speed controller we use two PIDs, one for throttle and one for brake. And the main purpose is to uh, maintain the desired speed. As you can see on this graph, the in red uh, there is a target speed which we calculated from path planning. And the uh, blue is actual speed that the vehicle uh, vehicle achieved. So when we want to, when is the desired speed higher than the actual speed, we will use the throttle PID to control the acceleration and in front of the con in front of the corners the brake PID for braking. Uh, we also implemented throttle limiter because when the steering controller has some troubles, we don't want it to give it a full tr throttle, for example. So if the there is some steering error, it will limit the throttle to, uh, to maintain the desired path. So that's all from the driverless pipeline. Let's look how we de develop the system. So we used robot operating system platform to develop the pipeline. The main things why we chose it is its modular system. So we can write each module separately and then connect them together and test them. Each module can be written in Python or C++. It depends on if you want to have the best performance of that part of the pipeline or you want it simpler and develop faster. And we use Formula Student Driverless Simulator, which is official, official simulator from Formula Student, as you can see here. You can com connect the robot operating system and your driverless pipeline to it, and it will simulate uh, all the sensors, and it is almost as real life. Okay, <laughs> so testing with car is very hard because this consumes a lot of time and you don't have the car ready every day. So how we achieve the testing without it? So robot operating system supports uh, data recording and then playback. So one day we took a car to the track and recorded uh, data from lots of different tracks and different times of day and stuff like that. And then we can play it back and test it on our pipeline. So we have data from real world and fine tune the algorithms on this data. Uh, for, but for control algorithm testing, we use still formal student simulator because you need to see how the car reacts to the, to the inputs. And the last thing you can have the algorithms best, the best algorithms that you want, but you also need hardware to run it on. And because it's a race car, we want the computer to be smallest, have the uh, least power, consume the least power and uh, don't need cooling, but that's not always possible. The two main routes are general purpose computers or embedded systems such as FPGA. Of course, the general purpose computers is beginner friendly, faster to develop and it's easier for testing but it's a lot heavier, larger, and less power efficient. But we chose this route because it's easier for the development and also faster. And when we will have the, all the algorithms fine-tuned, we can always go and rewrite the same, uh, same system, for example, on FPGA. So that's all from the development. And now we go test on the racetrack. Testing on the racetrack is hard because 99% of time this is how it this is how it looks. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it goes less left. Sometimes, sometimes it go to the right. But yeah, you have to tweak a lot of things for it to work properly. <laughs> yeah, you have to work in har harsh conditions. For example, sun is shining, you cannot see one line of your code, so you have to take some cover, or when you need to look at the data from the driving, but you have want to have steady, steady computer screen. You have to do a lot of things. But when everything works and everything is fine-tuned, here you can see the car driving on unknown track and doing a pretty good job. And here's the test of the acceleration. When the car was fine-tuned, we achieved around 45 kilometers per hour top speed, which is, compared to the competition, it's not that bad for a first-year team. So 
I would say I it was quite success. So what, we what did we learn doing this? Testing on real car is difficult. You cannot just hit restart when it goes out of the track. You have to push it to the start. <laughs> uh, for our team, driverless testing usually has lower priority. The higher priority is testing with drivers. So you have quite a limited time what you can do with the car. Environment is harsh. For example, testing in snow, snowy or icy conditions is not the best for programming. Uh, the next thing is keep it simple and stupid because driverless is really large concept. And at the start, we were planning a uh, lot of different things which we didn't have time for. So if you would keep it simple from the start, it would be better. Yeah. Testing artificial, artificial environment, we would like to have even better simulations than we did because when we first tested on the real, real data, we saw that a lot of algorithms had to be reworked slightly and simulations are your friend. Yeah. If we had better model of the car in simulations, we didn't have to do that much fine tuning on the track. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, we will, we will answer them for you. So the question was uh, if we are running everything in the car or we are having some cent central, for example, cloud provider, which uh, does all the calculations for us. No, we are running everything on the car. Uh, basically, it is not uh, restricted, but you, you cannot expect uh, having uh, best connection on every racetrack you are at. We are racing, for example, on Hungary ring, on Hockenheim ring on, in Germany, and you never know if there will be uh, good connection, for example, 4G connection. And basically, you can connect to your car wirelessly uh, locally, but uh, you you are restricted from having like some big uh, big antennas. So basically, it's usually uh, the case that you only can see uh, incoming data, like something really simple, the speed of the car, or if it's not in the emergency state. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the question was if there was any consideration of using machine learning. Yes, it was. It is much, uh, but it's much, much harder to tweak. Uh, for example, Q learning or some uh, some kind of re re reinforcement learning for the uh, for path planning, especially. Uh, we were planning on using that, but it's much harder uh, achieving some successful rate, and you cannot crash the car every time it uh, does something stupid. So we were uh, like uh, cons conservative with our approach, and we tried. Uh, we firstly tried to having some uh, like uh, prepared algorithms which will uh, plan the path, and uh, then then we can experiment with uh, using something like uh, reinforcement le learning. A uh, uh, question was if, if the path planning is uh, two-dimensional or three-dimensional. I think Mario can answer. Yeah, the map is two-dimensional because it's defined in our rules that uh, all the tracks are flat for the driverless, so we don't uh, don't need to calculate the elevation changes and stuff like that. So we use only 2D maps. Yeah, so the uh, question was how many adjustments per second we can make to the car, the steering especially. Uh, so yeah, our steering controller runs at 100 hertz loop, so 100 times a second we can send a new command to the steering controller. But of course, if it wants to do some big changes, it's dependent on the physical qualities of the motor, if it can, if it can do that. Yeah, so it's harder to answer that. But for small small movements, and it is possible to change it 100 times a second. Yeah, but you need to take into consideration PID control on the steering motor itself. 
so it introduces some kind of delay, but it wasn't the case for us. Like you can make uh, the adjustment at 100 uh, times per second, but of course it, when it gets to the tires, it's of course slower because tires have some response and all the, all the friction. The question is if we collect uh, EMU data from uh, gyro accelerometer and uh, GPS in the real time, yes we do. We have uh, EMU, inertial measurement unit, on the car with GPS antennas and it has got a Kalman filter running inside of it. So basically we have uh, our position data at kind of some kind of like uh, 50 hertz and acceleration data, data at uh, 1000 hertz. Yeah, so question was if uh, our algorithm or our driverless car is faster than uh, uh, than the human driven one. Uh, in Formula Student, uh, there are really faster uh, uh, autonomous cars, especially on the skid pad, which is a special discipline when you drive in uh, figure eight. So there, of course, you have a much lighter car, 70 kilos lighter, so, for example. So this is the biggest gain. Uh, but autonomous uh, algorithms can get really close to human-driven ones uh, or human-driven uh, capabilities. Uh, not ours especially, we are uh, getting there. But for example, in the simulator we used, uh, the driverless car can uh, get better times than the user on the, on, on the, for example, on the joystick. So for, for now in the computer, hopefully in next years it will be better than the uh, driver in real life. So I guess all the questions, thank you for your attention.